first panelist is Dr. Eileen Burford Mason, who is our expert on natural health products, especially on vitamin D, is a passion of hers. Her background is as an immunologist, cell biologist, and orthomolecular nutritionist. She has previously been an assistant professor at the University of Toronto in the Department of Pathology, and she was the director of the Conifer Head and Neck Research Lab at the Toronto Hospital. So, uh, my topic tonight is treatment and prevention of the common cold, and in particular, the uh, use of vitamins um, and other nutritional supplements. But tonight, we're going to focus on vitamin D, and it's particularly topic topical today, as you may not know, but today is International Vitamin D Awareness Day. And, uh, <laughs> Those of you who are familiar and have been thinking hard about vitamin D for some time and followed controversies involved um, may like to know about a website and a group, an organization you can join called the Vitamin D Council. And you'll get all the updates, on, uh, the latest updates on research on vitamin D as well as learned commentary. And that often is needed. So, how do I? Click on here, sure. Okay. I want to start off with a definition of the common cold. We need to know what we're talking about. And I take this definition from the Cochrane Database Review of Vitamin C and the Common Cold. They said in that the term the common cold does not denote a precisely defined disease, even though the illness is familiar to most of us. It is a complex of conditions caused by a broad range of viruses and occasionally bacteria. There is no unanimously accepted definition. Instead, various different operational definitions have been used, usually defining a minimum set of symptoms. Now, that's extremely important for researchers here to understand that when you're trying to do example, a, a, a systematic review or a meta-analysis of previous studies, that they may not all be talking about the same thing. Is it a cold or is it flu? That makes a difference if you're studying the common cold. On the right, you have a cold virus, and on, um, on, on the left and on the right, on my right anyway, you have um, uh, influenza type A virus. This is taken um, from a WebMD, a medical website, and it just looks, it was trying to clue people into, do I have the cold or do I have, have uh, do I have cold or do I have the flu? So symptoms can overlap dramatically. And the ones that particularly um, are um, stuffy nose, sore throat, sneezing, are common in the common cold, but they also occur in flu. So again, when people are doing research, it's important to distinguish how um, they have defined someone as having a cold. And in fact, there's only one valid way to say you have a cold, and that's to identify the virus. So one question I want to ask this audience is, do you think you could have a cold or the flu virus and have no symptoms at all? And the answer is yes. Many studies have been done, it really in the heyday of immunology was around the late 70s, early 80s, middle 80s, there was a tremendous flurry of activity. Before that, people didn't even know what, what you meant if you said, I'm an immunologist. But uh, then, of course, we had the advent of AIDS, and all of a sudden, that word was out there in the public domain. Studies have tracked the transmission of seasonal colds and flu during the winter and spring among the same family members. And they probably tracked the transmission of the virus using nasal swabs and blood tests, looking for antibodies against that particular flu virus. Although most family members did show symptoms, up to a third had the virus and no symptoms. And some of those had the virus but no antibodies either. So we need to think, what then? If you can have the virus and have no symptoms, what's going on when you do have symptoms? What is causing those symptoms? 
And we need to know a little bit more about the immune system. The immune cells are petroleum tissues and they're seeking out pathogens. And by the way, these petroleum cells that are looking for foreign streams of amino acids that are common to many microbes but not to our own tissues, they are dependent for their activation on vitamin D. So no vitamin D and they don't work very well. When they encounter a pathogen, they begin an elaborate process of disabling and eliminating them. And first of all, they have to surround the virus or the bacterium, engulf it, ingest it, and then kill it. And that involves rapid bursts of free radicals, damaging, unstable, largely oxygen mo molecules that will um, damage the microbe. And this is just a little schematic of that. And you see in the box there, various different types of free radicals. And then you see the neutrophils and the lymphocytes in the immune system firing these off to kill the viruses and bacteria. But there's also collateral damage, and that is the host is also damaged. So this is where you get sore throats, the achy limbs, the runny eyes, etc., and it's due to free radical release. Unfortunately, too, um, the free radicals can backfire and damage cells of the immune system, and some of the herbal products we have actually work by speeding up the replacement of those uh, immune cells and shortening the duration of the cold that way things like echinacea. And so what happens if you don't have protection against d or free radicals, then your immune cells themselves will be damaged, and so the, the, the cold will go on and on. So it is really the intensity of this reaction that causes the symptoms of the colds and flu. And when the cells die, that um, process is further handicapped. So you need to think, first of all, that the regulation of immune cells is related to many nutrients. I'm going to talk to you about vitamin D, but vitamin D does not work alone. This is a difference between researching drugs and researching nutrients. All the nutrients interact. So immunity depends on essential fats, particularly the omega-3s, B vitamins, particularly B6, zinc, vitamin C, and inadequate intake of any of these could increase the incidence or severity of colds and flu. Mega doses of single nutrients will only be minimally effective if intakes of other nutrients are inadequate. And that's a quotation directly from this 1979 period when there was a lot of research into um, nutrition and the immune response. So don't think that vitamin D is any panacea. It's the antioxidants circulating that will protect against those free radicals. But as I said early on, the actual patrolling of tissues and protect, protect, protecting you from the virus overgrowing in the first place will depend on vitamin D. So in my practice, I am very careful to quiz people about their immune system, how many colds do you get, how long are they, what is the duration, and I track how well they do on supplements based on whether those colds are less frequent and of shorter duration. I honestly will say that if I have been working with someone for say 12 to 18 months and they're still having colds, um, then I'm not doing my job. So you do not have to have the symptoms, you may certainly have the virus, but you don't have to have the symptoms. So this is a quote from uh, a paper, Vitamin D Controls T-Cell Antigen Receptor Signaling and Activation of T-Cells. And I liked it very much because it expressed exactly what I'm trying to say. When a T-cell is exposed to a foreign pathogen that has an immediate biochemical reaction and extends a signaling device or antenna, known as a vitamin D receptor, with which it searches for vitamin D. This means that the T cell must have vitamin D or activation of the cell will cease. 
if T cells cannot find enough D in the blood, they won't even begin to mobilize and control that virus. So we did see some studies come out looking at blood levels of vitamin D and tracking whether people were getting um, upper respiratory tract infections. And this was done in healthy adults. Uh, it was a prospective cohort study to determine if serum levels of 25 hydroxy D is your stable uh, storage form of vitamin D, and that's what you measure to know what your vitamin D status is. They looked to see if that correlated with the incidence of acute viral respiratory tract infections. And they measured it in 198 healthy adults over fall and winter. And what they found was concentrations below 38 nanograms per mil. Nanograms per mil is what the Americans generally use um, when they're measuring vitamin D. We use nanomoles per liter. That would be the equivalent of 95 nanomoles per liter. Our starting level is 75 for our normal range. If you have that level or more, it was associated with a two-fold decrease in acute upper respiratory tract infections. And there was also a marked reduction in the number of days ill. Now, this was another study, and it was done in Japan. They gave some school children 1,200 uh, international units of vitamin D3. That D3 is the natural form of vitamin D, which is in most supplements now. If you ever see one with D2, that's a synthetic, a synthetic version, which is about a third as effective. So it, it's not around very much in supplements anymore. So the primary outcome was the incidence of influenza A as diagnosed properly, not by symptoms, but by a nasal swab. And what they found was that there was certainly a reduction, a significant reduction in the number, the incidence of influenza A in those taking vitamin D compared with placebo. And in the children that were in that cohort who also had asthma, attacks occurred in two on vitamin D compared with 12 on placebo. So they also thought it generally increased the health of their lungs. Now, this is a recent study that's just come out and got a lot of airtime, and, and I commented on it on CGV News. This study looked at over 300 healthy adults, and they either gave them a placebo or vitamin D to prevent winter colds. And this was a study in New Zealand. And they dosed them, um, sort of strangely, they gave them a bolus of 200,000 international units at the start and for two months, and then they gave them 1,000 international uh, units a month for 16 months. And that works out, what, a, a little over two, 200 a day, 2,000 a day? So your slides. Hmm? Your slides is 100,000. Yes, no, but that's per month. I'm trying to talk, work out what it is per day. So there was an accompanying editorial to this. What they found was that vitamin D did not reduce the number of colds or their severity. Now, the accompanying editorial said vitamin D should join the therapies listed in the Cochrane reviews as being ineffective for preventing or treating upper respiratory tract infections in healthy adults. So just put it in the garbage, don't even think about it. What's wrong with this study? First of all, the starting levels of vitamin D were near normal in both the placebo group and the treatment group. Now this is one of the things that makes testing vitamins in clinical trials different from testing a drug. When you're testing a drug, you know your placebo group does not have the drug. And you know your intervention group has had it before, so it has no blood levels on it. So you can get a clear distinction between those two groups. With a vitamin, vitamins are essential for life itself. You cannot make your placebo group deficient without doing them harm. And so it's unethical. Also, we have the added problem with vitamin D, that of course it isn't actually truly a vitamin. It's what we call a conditionally essential nutrient. And what is the condition? Lack of sunshine. So how do you control 
for incidental sun exposure in the tumblers. So what you're doing is you're comparing various and fluctuating levels between the two groups that are relatively high. You don't get clear-cut statistics. And that's even before we think that vitamin D doesn't work alone. For example, vitamin D requires magnesium for binding to tissues. The final hormone that vitamin D becomes, 125-dihydroxyd, needs magnesium to bind to tissues. 90% of North Americans do not meet the RDA for magnesium. So how do you control for that? So it is much more complicated when we look at this clinical trial design. The other thing that was interesting was they decided that if people were taking a multivitamin, they could con continue on doing it. But in the tables, they didn't tell you how many people in the intervention group and how many people in the placebo group were taking multivitamin. So there are all of the other cofactors, like boron, like vitamin A, like vitamin K, like magnesium, like calcium, going in, but only into some of the participants. They only specified that the multivitamins should not take, contain more than 400 international units of vitamin D. So this is a very, very um, inadequate um, study. And in fact, it tells us nothing, one way or another, as to whether vitamin D protects from the common cold. <coughs> but I would say that my comment to CTV was, you know what? You can put gas in the tank. But if the battery's flat, the car is going nowhere. And so it is with researching nutrients. Vitamin D is essential, but it's no panacea. If it's not there, you will be vulnerable to many health conditions, not just the common cold. But even if it is there, you may still be vulnerable if you're short of antioxidants, if you're short of zinc, and other nutrients that the immune system requires. So thank you very much for your attention and I wanted just to finish with this quotation which I like very much. If I could live my life over again, says Rudolf Virchow, who's one of the most famous pathologists in the world, founder of Virchow's, the pathology journal which is still in existence, I would devote my life to proving that germs seek their natural habitat, diseased tissue, rather than being the cause of the diseased tissue. That is, mosquitoes seek the stagnant water, but do not cause the pool to become stagnant. And this is my book, just out in April, ready for third printing next week. There is a chapter on colds and flu. There is a lot more about vitamin D in the book, throughout the book. And uh, it will be available after this meeting, I think, in the lobby. Thank you very much. <coughs>